What a day. <laughs> 218 years ago, this aristocrat, the Nicolas de Caritat, Marquis de Condorcet, was hiding out in a villa in Paris. He had been a young liberal revolutionary, um, the liberal wing of the French Revolution. He had worked on the mathematics behind democracy. He had been the youngest person inducted into the French National Academy of Sciences. And his liberal politics got him in trouble with the terror and the Jacobins put a warrant out for his head. And while he was hiding out for five months, he decided, I'm gonna write uh, an encyclopedia about how much progress humanity's making. It's just kind of amazing situation, right? He's like, you know, he's like Solzhenitsyn, and he decides to write about how this is still an example of progress. Um, and he writes the first bit of that, the, first, the introduction to this, the sketch for an historical picture of the progress of the human spirit. And in, he, in it, he argues that reason is systematically liberating humanity from kings and priests and nature, that eventually we will not have uh, slavery, that women will be equal with men, that all nations will participate equally in the benefits of modernity, that we'll, we will even conquer toil, that men won't have to work anymore, women, uh, that we will eventually conquer death, that medicine will conquer all disease and people will have unlimited life. He was so optimistic, when he finished this document, this introduction to his encyclopedic work, he went for a walk and he got arrested and he died several days later in prison. But this idea of progress, of moral, political, scientific, economic progress that was launched, as we heard this morning, most powerfully by these Enlightenment thinkers, continues and is an ongoing struggle worldwide today. The struggle for liberal, democratic, political institutions, for civil liberties, for people to have the right to speak their mind and not uh, be prisoners of conscience. And this is uh, just this last year's, uh, uh, just this last year's Freedom House Democracy Index uh, guide to the different countries around the world, the kind of crude version of uh, trying to figure out how democratic different countries are. And of course, we're not <laughs> at the top of this green list. Um, uh, so there's progress to be done. Economic progress, the notion that we could all have better health, longer life, a higher quality of life, more leisure. This, as we heard from uh, Professor Blim, there has been a reduction in poverty worldwide. This is just since 1980 to 2010. Reduction in the percentage of uh, the world uh, at below the poverty level. And there's been an ongoing increase in life expectancy. So uh, this in the last, uh, uh, well, this is, this is the present right here, but this in uh, the last uh, 20 years or so, an increase in life expectancy. And in the last 100 years, an increase from 40 years, average life expectancy to 80. So scientific progress figured in this enlightenment model of progress with the idea that there was going to be a growth of reason and knowledge and that scientific and technological progress is complementary to social and political progress because so many of our problems, they believed, were the result of ignorance. Now, I think that there's reasons to be skeptical, as this is all say in a minute, but uh, the notion that if we could just show the reality of things to people that uh, self-governing citizens informed by science and reason would be able to cure many social ills. Now, as we heard from Professor Vogel, uh, most, most interestingly this morning, I think, uh, about Rousseau and Nietzsche and other reactions to the Enlightenment. The, the idea of the Enlightenment, of, uh, of Enlightenment progress was immediately controversial and it inspired much and ongoing resistance from the church. Uh, especially after World War II, the idea, the link between totalitarianism and the idea of progress or pro pro progressive ideologies uh, inspired widespread skepticism. The counterculture and ecology, as we've heard repeatedly today has inspired much uh, skepticism about the notion of, of progress because we may be destroying our planet. And intellectually, the postmodern movement within academia 
kind of under, uh, eroded the, and undermined the idea of progress by saying that this narrative had been used for many malicious purposes. Uh, one of the ways that we heard it was being used today from Professor Jafar and Ms. Erbal is to rationalize imperialism. Uh, this is the white man's burden illustration, the notion that it's the Britons and Americans and Europeans' responsibility to carry uh, uh, people uh, in less civilized parts of the world to modernity. And that rationale, of course, was a cover for other kinds of exploitation. Another way in which skepticism has come about is that reason itself erodes our moral certainty. We begin to ask questions, why? Why do we believe that certain things are superior? What is the direction of progress? Uh, how, how are we certain that this is, in fact, progress? And that reason is then erosive to the Enlightenment narrative of progress. We begin to see that science itself is not so separate from uh, the world, that in fact scientists are, have their own social biases, they can uh, be uh, undermined by their self-interest. Eugenics as a social movement very powerfully illustrated that scientists could be inducted into racial class uh, projects of, of oppression. And more subtly, Science is not offering truth. Science is about hypotheses. And so when you go up as a, a debater against someone who believes in biblical literalism, for instance, and you say, well, yes, evolution is just a hypothesis, but it's a pretty good hypothesis. And they say, well, I'm sorry, we have truth. You have hypotheses. And, and we see which one wins often, uh, at least in the public <laughs> sector. And finally, this notion that progress could stop. Progress is not a certainty, it's not an inevitability. As we heard from uh, Professor uh, Gallagher, the notion of progress that the Enlightenment uh, promoted was deeply influenced by Christian eschatology, the notion that there was a certainty to history, a teleology to history that was leading in a certain direction, could not be stopped, and in fact, you see this in Condorcet, he says that the progress of the human spirit will not be stopped as long as there's a planet. Well, that as long as there's a planet part, <laughs> he, did, he did recognize that the planet was necessary. Uh, and the planet itself has been called into question. Man-made and natural disasters could, in fact, stop the progress of civilization. So th this inevitability has become problematic. So when we put aside inevitability, in fact, biology has uh, told us repeatedly there is no inevitable path. Our evolution in the past and our evolution in the future is a random walk through chance. There's nothing inevitable in the progress of species, of the universe, uh, perhaps in the universe, but not in species. Uh, this, and this lack of inevitability is precisely why I think we need to call ourselves to a new chastened recommitment to the idea of progress. We can be committed to progress taking into account these various critiques, these various problems, these ways in which progress has undermined itself in the past, and commit to progress as a great work, progress as a project and not an inevitability. There is evidence that we have made progress. Uh, we heard reference to Steven Pinker's work. I urge you to read it. It's incredibly powerful documentation of how the decline of violence throughout history means that we are all so much safer than our ancestors were. Despite the genocides, despite the conflicts, despite the wars, all of us have a far smaller chance of dying violently than our ancestors did. Not to mention that we don't have lice and we get to wear clothes and have hot baths and all the other nice things about modernity, but we just don't, we're not gonna end up with our head bashed in. That's, I think, a good, good source of progress. For me, the evolution from gay oppression to gay marriage in just 40 years in this country, and, and in many countries around the world. I mean, South Africa has gay marriage. Uh, how quickly we changed our attitudes about civil liberties for sexual minorities around the world, how quickly it's changing today, is an incredible sign of progress. And in terms of this idea that we can't have moral certainty, Sam Harris, I don't agree with everything he says in this book, but I urge you to take a look at it. He basically argues that, look, even if you uh, can't rationally argue why certain kinds of social goals are better than others, we generally still agree longer life is better. We generally still agree, agree that less slavery, less torture is better, and we are seeing progress in those things. So scientific progress. Scientific progress is imperfect. 
Absolutely. But it is directional. This is one of the, uh, the things that we have to grapple with. There are scientific paradigms that need to be improved, but there's a huge danger in anti-science skepticism. And I just point you to the work on climate change and how many Americans inside the Republican Fox News uh, sound bubble um, don't believe in climate uh, change and are in a state of denial about the things that are happening in the world, even as we have the most extreme weather events that we've seen in recorded history. Um, I urge you also to take a look at Chris Mooney's new book, The Republican Brain, because it's actually kind of pessimistic. He basically argues that there are some people in our society who will never accept science as long as it conflicts with basic uh, core beliefs. That's pretty pessimistic. I, I still think it's possible to convince people that reality exists. <laughs> so I want to call you to some of my favorite ideas for the great project. And I have a, a long list, but just a couple. One is freedom from the gender binary. We heard about the oppressiveness of ideas about uh, ideal body, ideal genitals, and how they oppress women in different parts of the world. And so there's an ongoing need to struggle for freedom from patriarchal ideas and for equality between men and women. But we're reaching a new stage, at least in, in the Western industrialized countries, of feminists beginning to think about what it means to go beyond the gender binary itself. What does it mean to be, have a society that's free of gender? Uh, where we can choose a little bit of, you know, I want a little bit of this kind of gendered psychology and I want a little bit of that uh, gendered biology and, and have it be analog instead of digital zeros and ones. We're beginning to try to figure out what it might mean to have a new form of democracy worldwide. I mean, Occupy, I, I, it was great. It spread, it metastasized all over the world in a very short period of time. But it didn't give us any of the same kinds of institutions that we had in the 20th century, labor unions, political parties, civil organizations, that would be the backbone of what we call counter-hegemonic power, of being able to say to big corporations and, and, uh, and organizations of bankers and elites that we have an organization that can meet you on the playing field. We don't have that. We have spot demonstrations, you know, tag team demonstrations organized through Facebook and, and social media. We haven't figured it out yet. What it means to have new electronic forms of democracy that are as powerful, as lasting, as the older forms, which obviously are inadequate today. And finally, uh, in terms of democracy, the spread of democracy, one of the ideas of the Enlightenment was that, that there would be this continual spread. We would liberate slaves, we would liberate serfs, we would liberate women. But what about other forms of personhood in our animal friends and neighbors and cousins? If we look at the victories that have already been won for primates and apes, in Europe uh, so that it's almost impossible to do medical research on primates and apes. Um, in, in Spain and in New, New Zealand, consideration that the uh, sphere of human rights should be expanded to include great apes. Uh, I think that this is a project, not so much because it's the greatest form of suffering in the world, although I, you know, hierarchies of suffering are, are not a great way to think about these things, but because it's, it points to one of the central insights of the Enlightenment, which is that what's important about us is our subjectivity, our subjectivity as people, not that we have a particular kind of biological form, humanness, that grants us rights. It's that we are subjective people with feelings and interests over time, and we share that with many of our fellow species. <coughs> My friend John Horgan is one of the most cynical uh, people I know, and he constantly belittles my techno-optimism. Um, and he recently wrote a book that is more utopian than anything I would have written about the end of war. He's taken seriously, Pinker and the other folks who have pointed to the decline of violence worldwide and said, we are on the cusp. If you look at what's happening around Syria, if you look at what's happened around Libya, if you look at what's happening around Iran and North Korea, there's an international scheme of Trans, uh, of governance, an international set of institutions, the International Atomic Energy Agency and so on, which are trying to reduce the threat of war. And we can, as a global civilization, develop a, a truly profound set of global law institutions that would make the threat of war less and less over time. Secondly, we heard this morning from um, 
the doctor, oh, I wrote it down, and, okay, here it is, Dr. Yazdi, um, about uh, cancer medicine. I want to point something out about cancer medicine. If we were to cure cancer, heart disease, and stroke, uh, it would only extend the average life expectancy in the industrialized world by about seven or eight years. After cancer, heart disease, and stroke, most of us die of something else, Alzheimer's disease, pneumonia, other kinds of, of diseases. Um, the true killer uh, of human beings is aging, the aging process itself. And we are increasingly, through genomics, honing in on the core processes that cause the body to age. Therapies directed at the aging process itself are being researched in many different ways, many different locales. And within the next couple of decades, I, I feel certain, now I'm a sociologist, I always warn people, so my certainty means nothing, but um, uh, I feel certain based on the friends and the things that I read that there are uh, therapies coming in the next couple of decades, probably won't come in time for me, but they will come in time for you, many of you in the audience, to slow the aging process, T 10 years, 20 years, perhaps indefinitely. This is so key because one of the greatest fears that public policymakers have about breakthroughs in medicine is that it's just gonna exacerbate all these old folks who are gonna be this huge drain on the economy in nursing homes and uh, eating up pensions and the shrinking number of young people that are gonna have to support them. If we can keep ourselves healthy, uh, cognitively able into the, our hundreds, uh, we will be able to switch that around and turn it into a longevity dividend instead of a longevity problem. And finally, we heard from Professor Blim that uh, the decline of poverty doesn't necessarily mean that everything is groovy economically because there's been a vast increase in inequality as well. And part of that's because of technology. If you look at the percentage of the population in the United States that participated in paid labor, after World War II, it rose steadily as women entered the labor market until the year 2000. And since 2000, it's been falling steadily. And one of the causes of that is information technology, computers, robotics, automation, and globalization. The spread of uh, technologies which make it possible to do our jobs cheaper with fewer people, an increase in productivity, as it's often called in the business press. Now, we can either accept that we're gonna end up in a future a neo-feudal future in which there's 20% of the population with some kind of a job and the rest of us have to sit home, eat Cheetos, and watch TV. Um, or we can try to figure out what an egalitarian future might look like in which we all get to participate a little bit in labor and a lot more leisure. That's an optimistic future and it's one that Condorcet imagined. Condorcet didn't die in vain. We have great works to do. Thanks very much. <laughs>